It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Um, everybody has done some thank you, but I want to thank my brother Ron with Worley, um for hosting us, for Wayne and Mike for coordinating it, for Nancy from the Bigger Account History. A little closer. There, there you go. we go. Yeah. Hey, sorry. Let's so start over. Thank everyone for coming here. And then, of course, for Ron. Um, you know, host us here for Wayne and Mike for coordinating for Nancy from the Berga County Historical Society. Um, and I see Barbara here. I know Barbara Ant has, has helped as well here. So I'm not going to, I won't be able to thank everybody, but I um, want you to know some important items. Some people have asked. The restrooms are over there. There's food and refreshments, which I think Wayne and Mike have covered it over there and downstairs. Um, if you need to walk around, feel free. You'll break it, take a break in about 45 minutes. Was, we were going to go for an hour and a half, but I think you've already been here for 20 minutes. So at about 45 minutes, Mike is going to signal and we'll take a break. Um, I ask that you have pens and papers, but I think if you have pens on your purse and you have questions, as Wayne alluded to, um, if you have questions, write them down. Uh, because I'm going to cover a lot of information. Um, of what Henry Ford did. Um, and Mike and Wayne mentioned why we're here. The purpose we're here is to save uh, one of the few icons left of Henry Ford. If you look at all of his sites, which you're going to see in a moment, if you look at all of his sites, most of the icons are gone. Look at the smokestacks at Kingsford, the assembly plant, plant is there, the motor plant is there. The smoke stacks were demolished in 2002. If you look at lawns, uh, Ford lawns, no, it's gone. You can see where the tracks went down to it. And if you look at um, Pukwami, you can still see the Ford Tower in, and the Ford Mansion is there. Um, you look at Munising, the Munising ones, I stopped to see um, if you ever drove by there, you're going to see there was a big mill at one time. There was docks that went out. I stopped there several years ago, about 10 years ago, and I uh, asked a tourist person, I said, um, what about Ford? And she looked at me like, what? And uh, I said, he owned half your town, by the way. And as I was saying that to her, she stepped into her back office, and she uh, made a phone call. I figured something was up. We called her on Cabin Street. And, uh, this individual came in, I knew right away who he was, he was Doug Bogan. He was a state representative history teacher from Gladstone. And he was the city manager of Munising. And he said, what are you talking about? You just said that Henry Ford had to own half of Munising. I said, yes he did, and you're the city manager, you should know that. You're a history teacher from Gladstone, you should be a little better. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, if you go into your records, Mr. Bogan, you go into the county clerk's records, You'll see that he bought Munising in 1943, 1944. He built a sawmill. Never turned out a board for the lumber because Henry Ford was seen out at that point. But he built that sawmill. He came on his yacht, Cecilia, landed there, came into your town. And I said, if you know more, he actually bought half of Gladstone where you taught history. <laughs> and I said, uh, he's, you're, you're not, that's not true. I said, well, if you look at Henry Ford Day and the Governor's Day in 1927, you'll find that he put the railroad tracks down the center of Delta Avenue. He bought half your town and moved it. Literally moved the houses. Really? So, yeah. so a lot of the icons going back to Gladstone, to Munising, go to Big Bay, go to Pukwami. Um, Alberta's probably the last vestige of what Henry Ford uh, has left. Um, you have the assembly plant, Kingsford, but um, there's not a lot left. So hopefully today, um, in the last couple months, uh, so putting the spark into Berger County and even to the Michigan Tech, if I could say that, um, that we can save one of the last icons left in, in the EP. Um, what I share with you today is the knowledge of Henry Ford. It's not River Rouge. Okay. It's not Detroit. Because when Henry Ford came up here in the York, there's hundreds of books written about Henry Ford. Hundreds of books. Ford, Man and Machine, The Age of Henry Ford, um, 
Henry Ford, the light, the grassroots, Henry Ford and the Jews, Henry Ford and Hitler. Um, but if you look at all those books, they never really cover, they'll mention performing, they'll mention Iron Mountain, they'll mention Bonds, but they don't really cover it, it's a passing thing. David Lewis, he wrote The Age of Henry Ford in 1970s, and he came up here, he did a real good history, actually, I met him, University of Michigan professor, historian, uh, actually an industrial historian, that's why he was up here. He wrote a pretty good book about Ford. One of the most interesting books about Ford is Fordlandia. Fordlandia is hit Henry Ford's plantation, rubber plantation, on the Amazon. Kind of interesting. And the reason it's kind of his interesting is because there is more mention in this book about the bombing and Iron Mountain and Kingsford in Alberta than any book that's ever been written. And the reason for that is because Henry Ford duplicated what he did in the UP in the Amazon in Brazil. And he duplicated it by taking most of the lumbermen and the superintendents. I'm sure you heard of Roger Rogie, Ted Rogie. John Rogie came from Alberta and was a superintendent in the Amazon. <laughs> kind of cool. So when you start to read this book and you start, oh, I know who that is. I know who that superintendent is. It's because they came out of the UP and Henry Ford put them down in the Amazon to build the rubber plantation. Uh, it was another one, another one of his, uh, I want to say, he was getting up in years, but he tried to do something and he spent millions of dollars doing it, and it, of course it didn't work out. Uh, kind of an interesting episode of his life. What I'm going to share with you, hopefully, in the next hour, is the insight that Essel, Essel Ford asked me to give him. When Essel Ford came at the Model A convention, I think Dennis was with us. Oh, I want to thank Dennis for the, by the way, on the fire truck, because the fire truck is ready to go. It's been set for the TV cameras. It's ready to go. Um, he is the one that drove it. I think he's the second person that drove it besides Henry Ford. Pardon me. Uh, he drove it in the dome, the Model A convention. That was a featured vehicle at the Model A convention. And he has graciously came up, come up and uh, went through it. And it's got it started and it's ready to pull out for the television cameras. And he's going to drive it. But uh, I drove at, at the Model A convention, and this is kind of interesting when you think of the Ford family, and you think of the Ford Motor Company, you think of Etzel Ford, and William Clay Ford, and Benson Ford, the whole family. Um, they really didn't understand their grandfather, their great-grandfather. And it was kind of interesting 10 years ago, and sitting in the back of the Model A as uh, Ethel Ford wanted to know what his great-grandfather was like in the UP. He never knew. He never knew what his grandfather, his great-grandfather was like. He said, will you tell me? And you'll find out I'm a Whitman, and I kind of BS like my father did. So I said, you ask the questions, and I'll answer them. And so we drove around central UP in a model in the back seat I did with Ethel Ford, so he could find out what his great-grandfather was like. And that's one of the lessons you're going to learn as we go through today, is um, Henry Ford, the Upper Peninsula, Northern Michigan operations, lived on Henry Ford. And when he died on April 7th, 1947, at 2.43 in the morning, it died with him. Unfortunately, it did. Everybody knew it was coming. Those in the know in Alberta, Kingsford, and Pecan, and Lons, and Unicine, they all knew it was going to happen. So it was not a hidden thing. Uh, Henry Ford II had no love for his great first father, grandfather, no love for him. And so everybody knew that when, it, when he died, NMO was going to die with him. And uh, Henry Ford also said, his quote is saying, history's bunk. He didn't say that. Um, it was taken out of context because that he thought history was bunk. There would never have been a Greenfield village. <laughs> There had never been a Benson Ford Research Center, and there never would have been Alberta if he thought history was bunk. He didn't think history was bunk. It was taken out of the context. He said history in certain areas is bunk, but he never said history is bunk, and that's unfortunate. 
So while we may not be Greenfield Village, and uh, you know, we're not uh, in the sense of your, your support, we're not Greenfield Village, because your support is very important to the Upper Peninsula, to Ford's life. Um, as I mentioned, many of his properties are gone, uh, but uh, he is, we can still preserve what he was like, and that's what I hope to share with you today, what he was really like, what he felt up here, his love for the people. Uh, as Wayne mentioned, I've always been intrigued with Ford. Um, my father was part owner of Pukwami. I, I bought that fire truck back in 1974, my brothers thought I was nuts. And my family did, but I bought it, and it's an icon now. Um, I spent a lot of time in Detroit doing research at the Benson Ford Research Center um, for my master thesis. And then in the 70s, and I know it's getting back sometime, in the 70s I started interviewing people. Um, they were in their 70s or 60s, and I... And so I started interviewing people, and I have hundreds of people that I interviewed and thousands of hours of tape. Um, and my, my sons have finally said, Dad, after 45 years, you've got to write a book or you're going to be dead and brave. <laughs> very blunt, very polite about the tape. So I am starting to write the book, and I am going through the tapes. I've interviewed some of your grandmothers and grandfathers, or great-grandfathers, great-grandmothers. I have them on tape. Um, and someday, if you ask, I may be able to get up to you. We have a good arrangements to work it out. Um, but it's, it's great to come back. My, I always say I left Ponce, uh, I think, 45, 50 years ago, but my heart always stayed here. I, I love coming back here. Um, and why did we choose the world again? We could have chose Michigan Tech, Alberta. We could have chose uh, Michigan Tech. We could have chose Allegiant. We could have chose any place. I wanted to hear the world again because this is historic. If you walked over that the steps there, you will notice the world again was established in 1933. Why? Because the biggest towns in Barrett County at the time were Lawrence and Pukwami. And my aunt and uncle, great aunt and uncle, were business people. Denver Grasby, Roy Britton, Dan Britton, Martha Britton, they were business people. And they said, where do we want to build a dance hall? Because dancing was very popular. And so this place was built in 1933 as a dance hall. Halfway between Lons, three and a half miles from Lons, three and a half miles from Pukwami. That's why it's built here. And so you're, this is part of history right here. We're dealing with it. Okay? Now, Ford, let's go to Ford. What was Ford really like? He came here up here for really industrial purposes only. That's what he came for in the 1920s. The towns were small. There was not much infrastructure here. Not even basic communities, really. And he looked at it as an opportunity. He had just purchased the, the Ford Motor Company, lock, stock, and barrel. He owned all the stock in the Ford Motor Company. In 1919, he bought it all. The reason for that, he went into his control him. That's another whole story regarding these Jewish people. Okay, and his anti-Semitism was there because he did not want to be controlled. And so he bought the Ford Motor Company, Box, Stock, and Barrel in 1919. And the minute he did that, he said, I need something. I need two things. I need iron ore, and I need wood. Okay, and with that in mind, he said, hey, where am I going to get it from? I'm going to get it from the Upper Peninsula, you're going to see. So in that case, he said, okay, if I'm going to go up there, he wanted to build towns. Uh, Henry Ford was an engineer by trade. I don't think most people knew that. He was an engineer by trade. And he said he was very itemized. It was, he wanted certain things done a certain way. And so he said, if I'm going to go to the UP, I want efficiency. I want things to be done a certain way, my way. I was on giving a presentation in Duluth, Minnesota. And I was describing Henry Ford. And the woman yelled out, he was a dictator. I said, yes, he was, if you want to say a dictator. He followed the golden rule. What's that? I said, he who has the gold makes the rules. And Henry Ford had a lot of gold. <laughs> he made the rules. And so uh, when he came up here, he followed that. I'm, I'm going to do this. This is the way it's going to be done. Um, training is going to be important. The towns are going to be important. Um, 
people, he believed that people that lived in this community should be trained, and they should be trained from the grade school on up, so that it was going to be his future workforce. And you'll see that in his towns, how he developed that in a short time. Um, they needed to learn how to operate the lathes. They needed to learn how to operate the saws. They needed to learn how to operate the carriages. And you learned that not at the mill. You learned that in high school in the workshops. And that's what he did. Um, he also believed in building the communities, and you're going to see that with Alberta, you see that with Pequam, and especially those were his communal communities. That you had the schools at one end of town, you had the homes, you had the garden green where you grew your vegetables, and you had your mill at the other end. And so you had your church rows, which you're going to see. Everything was laid out exactly the way that he wanted it. He designed it. It wasn't by chance. He took the time and designed it, as you're going to see on some of these locations. Um, he, provide, he believed in providing the best for the communities, whether it be the workshops, the schools, halls, whatever. He, he wanted to do it that way. Um, so his personality, which he really couldn't do, he couldn't do that in Detroit River Rouge. He couldn't do that in the bigger places. I'm sorry, you have to advance the slide. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> You can watch that. <laughs> he wanted to build that um, design that he did it his way. It was, it was only his way. Well, I any question? I have a question for you. Which, where was the first Tesla sawmill built? First Tesla sawmill built in the world. That's an easy one. What was the question? Where, where was the first dustless sawmill built in the world? Alberta. Alberta. Where was the, who built the first prefab homes in the world? It's Alberta. No, who, built, who built the first prefab homes in the world? Sears and Roebuck. Where were they located? Chicago. The first prefab. I'll show you where they were located. They were located in the Kwame, the first prefab homes in the world. The first building with indirect lighting. Oh, that's the schoolhouse, is it, over in uh, Pequamine? That's correct. Very good. The schoolhouse, the high school in Pequamine um, has the first... And the little ones, too. And the little ones as well. They were built up at the same time. He wanted them built in 1933, which became an issue. Um, because the superintendent of Pequamine didn't follow through. He became the former superintendent right after that. <laughs> but... Um, that the, uh, he built, he asked those school, the schoolhouses to be built in 1933. Um, and then they, uh, they were, because he went with Edison's concept, Thomas Edison's concept, and so they were the first buildings in the country with indirect light. How are we doing there, Wayne? Doing great, but you gotta advance the slide once in a while. Well, I'll be quick now, this last time. <laughs> So years ago when I developed this program, uh, I, Dr. Ruth Repke Barons was my uh, mentor in the history department. Uh, Barron County Historical Society with Jim Dompier helped me a great deal. And so I know it's sometimes back we should have gave Mr. Dompier there. Um, but uh, Mr. Dompier helped me. The Menominee Range uh, was also, and as I said, uh, was the, uh, oh, by the way, this map here, I've got to acknowledge, this map is the original map, one of the original maps of Pequamy. And my sister happens to own it. She's loaned it to us. And I will use that extensively to, uh, to go through it as a site. While we're waiting, any questions so far? If you have a question. Any questions? Yes. What was the motor assembly? Iron Mountain? Is that what it was? Yeah, the assembly plant, um, that's why, if you know, they're Kingsford Flivers. That's why they're named after the car, right? And, and he built that. You'll see the progress of that. Actually, he landed, he went up there in 1921. That was his first holding. And that came from E.G. Kingsford. Of course, that's Kingsford, is Kingsford Charcoal, as you know today. Okay, but E.G. Kingsford came up there. 
And that was his first site, NMO, which you're going to see Northern Michigan operations. And uh, he built an assembly plant there. And all of the uh, gliders for World War II that landed in Normandy came from Kingsford, by the way. All the gliders. So that was an assembly plant. It was much more than that, too. It was a distillation plant. It was a um, chemical plant. It was a lot of things. And, and Kingsford didn't close down in one scoop when Henry Ford II sold it off. It was a partial sale of that property. Yeah, Alberta, was it named after Alberta Johnson or Alberta Kingsford? What was it, Alberta? It, the uh, they went to do, a uh, good question on that, they went to, and I'll, I'll cover it, but I'll say it now, is um, he went to dedicate the village, which you're going to find all kind of interesting how he did that, but he came, went to dedicate the village. The village was built, and Fred Johnson, which you're going to hear about, Mr. Johnson. Hey, I got you back. Okay, very good. Fred Johnson was there with his children. And one of them is Alberta. We're going to meet her on the slide. And he turned the television people asked him who, or the news people asked him what's the name of the town. He turned to the girl. What's your name? Alberta. Town's Alberta. That's how it was named. <laughs> That's how it actually got named. Now let's see, Wayne, if I can do this right. So, um, as I said, it's Northern Michigan Operations. That was the title for up here, NMO. You're going to see that in everything. You're going to see that on that cabinet right there, and you're going to find out why in a moment. But he owned these places, Iron Mountain Kingsford, Blueberry Mine, which is West Ishpeming, by the way. Uh, Imperial Heights, which is Michigami, by the way. Okay, if you've ever heard of Imperial Heights Road, that used to be that was a spur township, was a spur township mine. And um, he bought that um, in 1932, he bought that. Um, but that turned out, the metallurgists at River Rouge hated it because it turned out more dirt than iron ore. And that really went by the wayside. The same with West Ishpeming. It was They were poor mines. Henry Ford operated and he wanted it for the iron ore. But uh, Imperial Heights is still there. Not much left of it. Um, you'll see if, well, it's in a different program. Um, the lumber camps, he owned 18 lumber camps. You go from Covington, and you go to Ironwood, and you see Camp, uh, camp 1 Road, Camp 3 Road, Camp 4 Road. Those are the roads to his camps. Most people don't know that, but you'll see Camp 1, Camp 2, all the way to Ironwood. Those are 18 camps that were. Now, those were Henry Ford camps. They were called Lady Camps. His lumberjacks were called Lady Jacks by the other people because he required that you have showers, that your linens were changed once a week, that you showered, you had heated steam, you had heated uh, eating tables, um, you had um, sidewalks, and the other lumberjacks were at living in lice, looked in the straw, and had dirty clothes, and Ford wouldn't tolerate that. So the other lumberjacks, the contractor lumberjacks, called his lumberjacks Lady Jacks and his camps Lady Camps. Okay. Um, Alberta, Lance, Paquami. I mentioned the Heron Mountain Club um, because it, it was part of his life. He often traveled from Paquami to Lance and Alberta. Lance, he traveled from the Heron Mountain Club by uh, the Barlow, the luxurious tub Barlow. And he traveled, or the Yacht Cecilia, or one of his core ore carriers, but he traveled from the Huron Mountain Club to Lance and Pequawi. Okay, so I mention that because it was really part of his life, and he went from the Huron Mountain Club to Big Bay a lot in the end of his years. He went there. Um, Big Bay, of course, Big Bay was his last, really, uh, to me, this thing, was his last favorite holding, and he bought it because it was right outside the Huron Mountain Club. Numacy, another one of his last holdings, along with Big Bay, he went there to buy a $500 steam engine for Big Bay. You'll find that Henry Ford was very erratic. You'll see that coming out. Uh, he did what he wanted to do. He had the goal. And so he went there to buy a $500 steam engine. He bought the mill for $500,000, okay, that same day. And he bought half the town that same day and moved it not move the town, but ha bought half the town, turned to his aides that buy the town. That's how it happens with Henry Ford. He did it, he had the money, that's 
That's the way it was done. So Munising fell in line with Big Bay. He went there for Big Bay and ended up buying Munising. Gladstone is an interesting story because he couldn't buy Kingsford. The guy, the German farmer, would not sell Kingsford for what he wanted. So he got mad. So he went down to Gladstone and a, Martin Rose was jumping off the dock and he said, you shouldn't do that. He was with E.G. Kingsford. And he said, what do you mean? It's fine. And Ford said, what do you mean it's fine? He said, well, it's deep, it's deep, it's deep port. And Henry Ford turned to E.G. Kingsford and said, buy it. And he bought half the town. And in the year, six, eight months later, he moved half the town. There's photographs of Mark Rose with the town being moved, like one of the houses. So I, I turn what we're covering today, then those are his northern Michigan sites. They're part of NMO, Northern Michigan Operations. Uh, and uh, I covered Iron Mountain Kingsford because it really wasn't his favorite, but it was his headquarters, so that's where he went to get the lowdown. You're going to see how we operate. Uh, Alberta, Pukwami, Big Bay were his favorite places. And that's the map of where they're located. Uh, so you have Gladstone down here, Iron Mountain. The logging camps go from here over to here. You have Pukwami, Lawrence, Alberta, in the same Big Bay, through Mount Club. Henry Ford owned <coughs> If you take out the national forest and all the other land that was private, he owned 82% of the UP. That's how much he owned when he actually, at the end, owned. And what, as I mentioned to you, he felt that at the end, it was his playground. This was his playground because when you look at it, he came here for the iron ore, he fell in love with the, he had to still need the iron ore, but he fell in love with the place. And at the end, when he had a stroke in 43 and he was going senile, he was losing over a million dollars a year with his operations. Of course, you're going to say, what was that to Henry Ford? He owned 100% of the Ford Motor Company. He was wealthier then than Bill Gates is today. His personal wealth, and he owned the Ford Motor Company. Lock, stock, and barrel. He was wealthier than, we always think of Bill Gates. No. You go back to economic times, how much Ford owned he was wealthier than he was today. Um, you know, we, we look at Henry Ford and look at all these books, and we only really catch a glimpse of what he was really like. Because it was the people that he shared his love with when he came up here, and all his little antics that he did that showed how he was really like. And I always say, you know, he wasn't a saint, he wasn't a sinner. You heard me, in, I was in the paper today. He wasn't a saint, he wasn't a sinner, but he loved the people. He loved the people up here. And uh, even when it was cost him, in the Great Depression, when everything was shut down, four towns operated. Four towns in the Great Depression. I don't know, Kingsford, Alberta, Lons, well three, because Big Bay was open then. In the Depression, those four, those three towns operated. He employed everybody. Never laid anybody off, even during the Depression. And why? The strike was shut down because he loved it up there. It wasn't going to happen. Uh, Henry Ford believed in individualism. Uh, and the way that he operated is, you know, um, I expect you to make you a full person. I'm going to teach you how to do things. Um, you're going to uh, have a garden. You're going to see in these villages, they had to have a garden. Why? Because you're going to have one foot in the plant, and you're going to have one foot in the garden. You're not going to starve. And that's what he did with all these communities. You had gardens you're going to find out, because he believed that you shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't be the industrialists uh, just taking care of you. Uh, his best friends, of course, uh, were Thomas Edison, Harvey Firestone, time to tell a story, hey Wayne, is um, th they came up here in 1923 with President Harding. And uh, as I said, when he operated Iron Mountain Kingsford, he always went there first. So he'd come on the yacht Cecilia and he had landed Escanaba and then he'd travel by car 
with his, his cars, his special hunting camping wagons, his fleet of camping wagons that he made. And he'd go to Iron Mountain Kingsburg. Then he'd traverse up here, okay, with those people. And I heard a story about, a, uh, you can appreciate this, I think. It was about a Finnish guy. He's out in the woods. He's in Amazon, 1923, and he's walking through the woods. And um, I heard about it by, this was in the 70, or 1970s, and he was in his 70s. It happened when he was in his 30s or that. And so whenever I heard a story, I'd always look up the guy. Did this really happen? And, and so I looked him up and introduced myself and said, can I tape you? And he said, sure. And I said, did this happen? He said, yes, Mr. of it, did it happen? He said, I was walking through the woods, and I was just walking through the woods, and I come across this party. And I walked in, and this guy jumped up, and he said, I'm Henry, I'm Henry Firestone. Come in, have a cup of coffee. He said, thank you. So, ready to sit down, and Mr. Whitman, and the next guy jumped up, and he said, I'm Harvey Firestone. It's a pleasure to have you with us. And he said, well, I had a Firestone tires on my logging truck, and I knew the name, but I didn't know what he looked like, but I shook his hand, and I said, it's a pleasure to see you, too. And he said, ready to sit down again, and the next guy jumped up, and he said, I'm Thomas Edison. He said, it's a pleasure to have you with us. He says, well, Mr. Ben, I knew a light bulb, and I knew Thomas Edison's name, but I didn't know what he looked like. And then I sat down, and the next guy jumped up, and he says, I'm President Harding. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Now, not only offended, but it's a little offensive language, but it is history. He said, well, I voted for the son of a bitch, but I didn't know what he looked like. <laughs> and so I shook his hand, and I said, it's a pleasure to meet you, too. He said, then when I'm ready to sit down, I looked over, and there was this Asian guy. Now, Henry Ford was a vegetarian, and he always brought Harry Soto with him. Harry Soto was an Asian, he was a vegetarian, and Henry Ford was a vegetarian, so he cooked for him. And he said, now that you think I'm a dumb son of a bitch, I'm going to think, I think you're going to tell me you're Santa Claus. And he said, no, I'm just a cook, I'm Harry Soto. That's, that's an Amazon machine in 19... 23 on one of their trips, not saying it's this trip, but they're playing mimics here. They're, they're um, playing around with their, because uh, Henry Ford did not believe in guns, by the way. Or, I mean, that's so Ford, they didn't have a good relationship. And that was the problem with, you'll see, with the Upper Peninsula Northern Michigan operations, is that uh, Henry loved the UP. Etzel Ford was considered not only the offense of a ladies' man, and not in the sense maybe we think of a ladies' man today, but he was more of a lady. He was into operas and symphonies and orchestras, and Henry Ford wasn't into that. Okay? And there was not a good relationship. There was just a story I read in the book where Henry Ford went and built nine kilns at River Rouge. And um, Harry Bennett, who was a goon squad, I shouldn't say a security man, but he was really a mafia, um, he said, um, he's building these. He says, don't worry. When he finishes them, I'll tear, you, tear them all down and fire everybody. He wait, waited until he built them all, and he, was gonna, he literally tore them all down and fired everybody. So there was that relationship that didn't really go well uh, between Etzel and Henry. And Henry Ford II, when he took over the Ford Warner Company in 1944, 45, for Gates, is that there was not a lot of love. And so everybody knew once again what was going to happen with Northern Michigan operations when, when, it, when it went down. So that was the, the relationship between those two. Uh, I mentioned this emblem, and this is kind of important, this emblem. Everything that Henry Ford owned, and I know if Tracy Barrett is here, but Tracy Barrett was telling me, which I already knew, is that NMO meant Northern Michigan operations. And on top of that, and in the first years that it was on there, it was a faded yellow, not because of age, it was faded. Henry Ford didn't like that, so it became a bright, a bright yellow, if, if necessary, a green background. If you look on this cabinet right there, you'll see Pukwami and NMO. Everything that Henry Ford owned, including his bed frame, his bed, has it marked. Okay. I was at visiting the Iron Mountain Kingsford Museum, and they said, this belonged to Henry Ford. 
I said, well, if it did, it's going to be marked. What's well, not marked? I said, well, it's going to be marked. And it had a brass tag on it. And I said, take, take off that brass tag. I'll tell you what it tells you. I'll tell you what it says before you take it off. This IRMT, Iron Mountain. She took it off. She says, how did you know that? <laughs> I said, if Henry Ford owned it, um, it has it on it. I went to Munising when I was found out about Munising. And I had a chance, the mill was gone, but I got to talk to Chuck, Chuck Nebel to see on that. And I said, Chuck, I started talking to him, he said, I have got the doors that now were never put on the mill at Munison. My father bought them, they're in a garage. I said, you gotta be kidding. 12 foot solid oak doors, 12 feet high, six feet wide, solid oak. I said, will you show them to me? Sure. So we went to this garage on Main Street in Munising, brought me into this old garage, dilapidated garage. And he said, what are you looking at? What are you looking for? And I said, well, if this was Henry Ford's, it's going to have M-U-N on. And I, have, I said, here, this was Henry Ford's, it's got M-U-N on. He had stamped M-U-N with N and O on the bottom. So when Henry Ford owned something, he always had it labeled. That's the way that he, that's the way that he did business. Okay, uh, Iron Mountain Kingsford, he bought that in 1920, he flew in, or came in on Cecilia, then he went to see E.G. Kingsford, well he went to see E.G. Kingsford, who was his cousin who owned a dealership in Marquette, and he took E.G. Kingsford to Boston, and he said, hey, I need iron ore, this is 1920, I need iron ore, I need lumber, do you know where I can get it? He already probably knew where he could get it. And E.G. said, here, here's a spot to get it. So, in 1921, he comes to Kingsford. <clears throat> There's a German farmer who just bought a big German, built a German farmhouse. Now, you know what Germans do. They build out a brick, right? And he built this beautiful farmhouse. He wanted $100,000. And Ford, when you find out about Ford, certain things he did, you're not getting $100,000. I'll give you fifty. At that time, as I mentioned to you, the iron ore industry is closing down. The mines are closing. There's not business. People are without work. The people of Kingsford, or Iron Mountain, there's no Kingsford at this point, they get together the $50,000. Farmer gets 50, Ford, we give them 50. Ford found out about it. No go. Ain't gonna happen. That guy isn't getting a dollar over $50,000. Now, we don't know what's happened. We know the guy went to Detroit. We know there's a deed for one dollar at the Dickinson County Courthouse. So we don't know what that guy got. But Henry Ford got the land. Now was it for 50 or 100? The deed shows a dollar. But he got his land. Uh, and that's why he was gonna to go to Gladstone is because he couldn't get the mill at Iron Mountain, Kingsford. So he was going to go to Gladstone, but of course then he got the, he got the uh, land at, at Kingsford. Um, that's in 1919 that it happens. Um, it was about this time that Ford Motor Company is really expanding. Remember he buys Ford Motor Company lock, stock and barrel in 1919. So he's expanding. Uh, he wants the iron ore. He wants the lumber. And uh, so he's going for it. Uh, it triggered a boom in Iron Mountain, Kingsford at that time. Uh, prices soared from 100 to 300 percent in that community when he bought it because of speculation. Um, as I said, he went up there after he bought it, went up on the yacht Cecilia, and he, uh, it was a blueberry patch. It was a blueberry patch. Once again, it was a blueberry patch. He laid out that town. Now, if you go to Iron Mountain, if you go to Kingsford, and you look at Kingsford, go to Chicago, or go to Detroit. Detroit has the St. Clair River, right? Kingsford has Monopoly River. So when you travel down Grand Boulevard, or Boston Boulevard, or Linwood Avenue, you're traveling down Detroit, because that town is laid out exactly like Detroit, because that's the way Henry Ford wanted it. Okay, people don't realize that when they're they're traveling down there. That town is another mini Detroit. Sh Detroit River, St. Clair River, Menominee River. That's how he laid it out. Uh, not long after, uh, he built a sawmill. Now the sawmill, 
the Model T needed 250 board feet. It's 82 percent wood, by the way. You need 50 board, 250 board feet. And as foresters figured out that in order to get four Model Ts, you needed one tree. And Ford's projections is he needed a million trees each year. So that's why his loggers were given the mission of you will get this many trees from hell or high water because I need 250 board feet for each Model T and this is what I want to build. So go get it. And so it, and the Kingsford was turning out about a million board feet that first year. That's how it was done. That's how he wanted it done. Um, after that, he built kilns. This is the smokestacks I told you about. They were 190 feet tall. They were demolished in 2002. Um, they were deteriorating. They were a liability factor, so they were taken down. That was one of the biggest icons on the UP of the Ford Motor Company. Um, but they were taken down. Uh, you can see the Ford water tower. That is still there. It has Lodal on it though, right now. And, and that's one of the uh, burning plants uh, for combustion. Uh, the flipper, the Woody was there, there. That was one of the last cars made at Iron, at, at Kingsford Iron Mountain. I put the two together, really, because they're really synonymous there. But the, uh, the Woody was made there on the assembly line. As I mentioned, the, uh, this is the assembly line in, in the Iron Mountain, or Kingsford Iron Mountain. And this is Kingsford um, distillation plants. That's one of the assembly buildings, um, another assembly building. Uh, with locks of pies that are now low dog. And let's turn to Alberta. I mentioned the Johnson family. The Johnson family, uh, Fred Johnson was the superintendent of NMO, and this is his family. She is the Michigan beauty queen in 1933, um, and this is Alberta. Or this is Lillian, this is Alberta, I'm sorry. She's the beauty queen, this is Lillian. She was actually here at the Model A convention. And Ford gave her a car, gave her a dish set, and gave her a baby buggy. <laughs> and the, ba the baby buggy was at Alberta uh, in, 19, in 2012, when we had the Na National Model A convention. That is a Lincoln Continental, by the way. This is 1942, and what's going on in 1942? The war. But uh, he got the, uh, he got a, uh, the family got a, um, that, that car. Interesting enough, I'm going to turn to, jump back to Kingsford, I know. What happened? In the end, Kind of interesting. This is the interesting thing is when you start to dig into data and you start to dig into information. Remember, I mentioned Ford suffered a stroke in 1943. Okay, and remember I said about NMO and the people not liking it, his relatives. So when Ford suffered the stroke, everybody knew that when he passed, it's gone. Most people knew that. They the um, Henry Ford II came out publicly many times and said it. That, hey, when my grandfather's gone, guess what? So it was not a hidden secret. And so when Ford suffered the stroke, people thought, NMO thought, okay, it's kind of the shades are closing. Fred Johnson realized, thought, okay, I can see the writing on the wall. So in an effort to save himself, I don't think it really would have mattered. I mean, NMO was going off the screen, off the radar. He could talk, and you're gonna see, as you think of Paquaming, when did Paquaming close? What's the last high school class? 40, 41. 42. Still going in 42, the high school is. Is the high school there in 43? No, there's no graduating Kauai. Because Ford had a stroke in that fall. Okay. And so in 43 and 42, the Kwame closes. Lots of those open because there's lumber there they want. Alberta closes. 
Um, Iron Mountain is trying to survive, still stays open. Blueberry Mines is gone. Munising has gone. Gladstone's gone. The Bay is gone. Because Pussyfoot Johnson, I use the name now and bring it out. Hopefully his relatives aren't here. His name was Fred Johnson. They called him Pussyfoot. He had no backbone. And everybody called him Pussyfoot. And so when I was talking to Lillian, kind of interesting, I was talking to Lillian and I asked Dennis when we were having our conversation to her, I was trying to find out what happened. And she said, Keith, we were there one day, remember this Dennis, and all of a sudden we were gone. You'll find that's true with Henry Ford. You'll see that in the next few minutes. Please. Is that you did it his way or the highway? And um, if you didn't do it his way, so um, when he had the stroke, everything was moved out of the farms. Everything was moved out of the towns and brought to Iron Mountain, Kingsford. Unfortunately, for, all, for someone, Henry Ford got better. <laughs> and you'll hear that. Is that, um, and I'll share the story now, is, is Kingsford's closed, the towns are closed, Henry Ford comes back in 1944, and I have this on tape, it's rather interesting tape. Is because looking at the archives, I see where hold it. They're hiring school teachers in October and September, they're hiring school teachers for these towns. And all of a sudden, there's an email that goes to CJ Sullivan from uh, Superintendent Dow at Kwame is the school is closing, just like that. And there's weeks, the school board's called in some emergency session in Lons that this is happening. Why? Because Mr. Johnson decided there's a stroke, close everything. I'm going to survive. He moved everything. Ford gets better. But Ford was very smart. He was a very smart man when he came to the UP. He knew there could smell a rat a mile away. He didn't go to Iron Mountain Kingsford. That's where he always went. He always went to Northern Michigan Operations Headquarters. He didn't go there. He went to Alberta. And he drives up to Alberta, and Ted Rogie's there. Ted Rogie is the superintendent that was left behind. Fred Johnson left one superintendent, one person behind to run the town. He drives up, and he said, where's everybody? Ted says, what do you mean, where's everybody? You shut the town down. I did. Yeah, you, who told you to shut the town down? Fred Johnson. Oh, get in the car. In the old days, you made the next call for your buddy. You called up to Lance, and Lance called up to the Kwame, and the Kwame called up to tell the boss is on the way. Ford knew that. Get in the car. You couldn't be no phone call. And he gets in the car, and they go to the Kwame. And then the Kwame, Walter Dolores said, that Walter on tape part. And Walter is standing there, and the limousine pulls up, and there's Ford and Ted Roby get out. And he starts saying, where's everybody? What do you mean, where's everybody? And Ted Roby is behind Ford going, he doesn't know. He doesn't know. So now the lights click on, eh? And Ford looks at Walter and says, I want to go in the high school. And Ford says, no, you don't. Or, Walter says, no, you don't. Why not? Because there was nothing there. Now, you did a few things, but you didn't touch anything of Henry Ford's and anything of Clara Ford's. And Clara Ford bought a baby grand piano for the high school. Think of that. Henry Ford said, if I die, I come back into the world, and when Clara's my wife again. That's how much she loved her. And that piano was gone. Henry, where's the piano? It's gone. Where is it? It's gone. I went and go up to the mansion. No, you don't. Why not? He took everything out of the mansion. Ford said, get in the car. Not going to be a phone call made this time. And he said, Walter and Ted both said in separate interviews, they had never seen Henry Ford cry. They were in the jump seat in front, and they, he was in the back of the seat crying. And I said, that was the worst journey we made in our life. Henry Ford in the back of that car crying all the way to Kingsford. He 
got up to Kingsford. He said, get out of the car. I want you to see what's going to happen. Uh, he got out of the car and he said, watch what's going to happen. He walked and he said, why'd you do it? And he said, um, because uh, I had to. He said, you don't have a job anymore. That was the end of Pussy for Johnson. That's why Lillian understood, didn't understand why his father left so quick out of Kingsford. That's what happened with him before. Let's take the break. We were talking about uh, these people here, the Johnson family, and that's Lillian on this. That's Lillian here, and that's Alberta here, and this is a Michigan beauty queen, by, just by chance. She's a Michigan beauty queen. So I mentioned that the family, um, when we were doing the interviews, uh, Dennis and I were there, and we were doing the interviews, uh, and uh, she said we had to leave quickly. And I knew why, and I asked Dennis, should I move to it at all? And, she, and it was not proper, so I did not, I knew why they left very quickly. Ford had a habit, is that, as I said, you did it his way or the highway. And um, as he owned everything in the town, you did it his way. You painted, you kept your lawns clean, you kept the gardens growing, you did that. And if you didn't, there was a fleet of trucks, which you're going to find out about. And that fleet of trucks is that if you did not do it, within two hours, you were gone out of town. So that's the way. And, and so I'm sure maybe not two hours for the uh, Johnson family, but I'm sure it wasn't uh, too much after that. Uh, that's uh, Lillian again with that Lincoln Continental, which I think she gave me that slide, actually. Uh, this is the mill, as you can see, the old cars. That's uh, where the, what the mill looked like. Uh, that's Fred Johnson there. Now, Henry Ford was a publicity hound. Everything he did, he made sure he got publicized. Okay? That's the way he operated. And he was a sharpie at it. He was a perfect uh, connoisseur of uh, public relations. One thing he did not allow in the Upper Peninsula is to be photographed with kids. You will only find a few photographs of Henry Ford with kids. When he was square dancing at the bungalow, when he was driving in the fire, we've never found a photograph of Henry Ford driving the kids on the fire truck. And uh, Bob Krepke, the Ford Motor Company in Storm, said you probably won't. Uh, Bob Krepke is, is a good friend of mine, the more former uh, retired Ford Motor Company story. He was surprised we came across this photo of Henry with the kids because Henry never allowed a photographer around when he's with kids. That was one thing he did not want. He wanted the kids to be left alone. And so that's a kind of surprising one. If you notice though, Mr. Ford is quite old. So this has got to be in uh, probably about 43. Um, just before the stroke, because after 43, of course, one of those people wouldn't be in that photograph. As I said, it's named after Alberta, his, uh, his, one of his daughters. Um, he wanted the town, he decided in 1936, he wanted a self-sustaining sawmill community built on a utopian concept. That is, it's self-sufficient. Everything is made and done there. Um, the community was quite small, there was 12 houses. There was originally going to be 240 houses that if he had lived, I'm sure it would have been. There was going to be a general store, churches, everything that Pequamin had. Unfortunately, um, it, it did not occur, he, he got sick. But um, it was a cameo community. Interesting the fact is he went there and dammed up the uh, Plumbago Creek. But there's another reason he built, and Michigan Tech will love this, is that if you go from, and Ford knew this, everybody thinks Ford was just one way, and he wasn't. He was a very, very industrial, he thought things through. And if you go from Lons to Pequamin, you go through seven glaciers. Did you know that? You go through seven glaciers. You go through seven woods. Let's take the first one from the bay, go up to the Catholic Church Hill, or the Lutheran Church Hill. That's one. Go from there to the state police post. Huh? There's another hill there, isn't there? Now we're going to go up to where the shop go was. That's three. Now we're going to go 
to where the railroad tracks are and you go up that first little hill, that's four. Now you get to the top of that hill, that's five. Now you go down that great big ravine and you go back up and that's six. And you go a little bit further, there's another one and that's seven. There are seven different glaciers between Lons and Tuquami, or Lons and Alberta, and Fort knew that. And there are seven different forests there. And so he said, hold it, I can do this in less than nine miles. And so that was one of, another reason he had that town built there. Um, I'm working with Harvard and Yale right now, and uh, we're doing research at Point Abbey on, on Teutonic times. And uh, Teutonic times are 10,000 years ago, and we're looking for villages that are 60 feet under the water off of Point Abbey. Um, there was no Lake Superior or the Great Lakes, there was Lake uh, um, Agresti. And Lake Agresti was bigger than the Great Lakes, that's about where Manitoba's at right now. And so we're doing research. And that follows into the glacier periods that Ford was talking about, or we're talking about with Ford, what he was looking at. So in that nine miles, um, he bought, he, you can look at those forests, um, 40 acres of lumber were cleared, 40 acres of forest were cleared, uh, a powered sawmill, accessory buildings, two schools, 12 houses were built, and a garden was plotted. Um, but unfortunately, let's see, uh, the part of the town. The schoolhouses were at one end of the town, as I mentioned. Um, two grades in each school. In this case, there was four, because the high school kids had to go to Bequamia, okay, and then later to Lons, when Alberta first opened. And uh, so there was two schools, which we'll cover a little bit more in Bequamia. They were located at one end of the town, as I mentioned, the houses in the center, the village green. This is a village green. As I mentioned, Henry Ford says you will have one foot in the mill and one foot in the garden. And this is the garden. Everybody had a four acres of plots, 50 acres of wood to cut to heat themselves. Heat it twice. Heat yourself twice. Cut it once and put it in the, put it in the burner and that's heat yourself a second time. And you'll have a garden so you don't starve. Unfortunately, that didn't go too well because the deer decided they liked the garden better than the people did. So there was no garden after that. Uh, interesting about this mill, this mill is built, it's framed out of Norwegian pine. And if you ever go into Henry Ford's mills, they are gray on the bottom. You could go to River Rouge, you could go to Georgia, you could go to Pukwamin or Lons or any place, and they're gray on the bottom and white on the top. That was standard. Just like you have any colored car you want, as long as it's black. Henry Ford was very set in his ways. And so, um, with this mill, he wanted it varnished. The only mill that he ever wanted varnished. He wanted the mill varnished. And for whatever reason, they either didn't like Henry Ford, or didn't follow his correct directions, and they painted it green. And Henry Ford came up to dedicate it. There were a lot of people without jobs after that. <laughs> it was stripped, and they varnished it. Then he came back and dedicated it. Kind of interesting, if you look at this, and a lot of people, when they were building that town, Henry Ford would come and sit in this area and sit as a bum, just as a bum. <laughs> and he watched them build the mill. Kind of interesting about that. When you really look at the, we're going through the archives and you see why did he have a special interest in Alberta? Because he came up there, he designed the mill, it was the first dust of sawmill in the world. He wanted it done a certain way. And he'd come and sit on a log here and uh, watch him build that mill. If you look across here, you're going to see F-O-R-D. How many have seen that? Great big letters. Well, you see the little letters right now, don't you? You speak in the little letters or the big letters? There were great big quartz letters. You can see the F-O-R-D. That was in great big white letters in quartz rocks. The kids had a different idea of where quartz rock should be. We found right about here now. But that was uh, for Henry Ford wanted that in quartz rocks. Um, that mill put out, it was varnished, hardwood floors, well-spaced, steam-driven. Machineries were made it maintained spotless. Daily production ranged from 18,000 board feet to 23,000 board feet of hemlock. Um, 
They said the mill shut down briefly in 42. They said it was to manpower shortage. But it wasn't a manpower shortage. We know what it was for. That's when he suffered that stroke in 42, 43, and that's when that mill closed down. It did reopen again in 1943 after he discovered it, and it operated until 1954. And in 54, a community in 1,300 acres of adjacent timberland were donated to MTU. Um, and they've been operating it. For, they operated it for a while for instructions for their students, and then it uh, went into a museum. And then, the, as I understand it, someone correct me if I'm wrong, is that the safety people said it wasn't safe. They had to um, make safety accommodations to it so it could operate. Um, it was interesting when I interviewed uh, Roger Rogie, uh, that would be Ted Rogie's son in 1976 on tape, and I said, you know. At that point in time, the mill was very beautiful and operating very well. And I said, you know, um, your father was superintendent out here as well. And uh, well, how come it's done so well? And he said, the old man would be quite pleased. He's speaking of Mr. Ford. He said, the old man would be quite pleased if he returned to Alberta now. This is 1976. The town is much like the way he left it. But then I suppose, how could it be otherwise? They left us a huge book on how it was to be run when they turned it over to us. And that would be, that would be true with, with, uh, with uh, Ford. Uh, as I mentioned, that's the first dustless sawmill. A pump house. Henry Ford was very much into fire protection. He was very much into painting. He was very much into fire protection. All of his mills had the latest fire protection. The best fire protection in the world at the time. Whether it be River Rouge or Alberta or Perquani. Lungs. Um, and he made sure that they had pump houses, high fire hydrants, uh, fire trucks. He made sure everything was up to snuff the way that he wanted it. We turned to Bequami, NMO. Uh, interesting town. Uh, 50 year anniversary, I'm not sure what year it was. Maybe someone can tell me. Maybe Barbara can, when her mother was here up in the Whirligate. It was up here in this dance floor. They had their 50th reunion of all the citizens. And Pequamie was someplace special. I actually got a hat. And that's actually where I recorded a lot of these people giving their history of Pequamie. Quite interesting. I gotta tell you, kind of funny, about 10 years ago, is Miriam Roa here? Rosemary Bianco? That's Rosemary Roloff and Miriam Roloff. That's Ted Roloff and Bill Roloff. They're all the same family. All in Pequamie. I interviewed him about 10 years ago, and I brought him up to Mary, Rosemary Bianco's house up by the state police post, and I sat him down. You talked that's the best interview I ever had in my life. I had three young ladies, and they started talking, and they said, I never knew you did that. I can't believe you did that. You did that? Oh my, I never knew that. These three ladies went on for about three hours of fantastic tape telling the stories of Pequamie. Uh, some of them they never heard from their sisters before, but it was quite an interesting interview to have that with them. Um, in 1950, 1969, Pequamie was considered the best ghost town in America. It was considered the best. The state of Michigan tried to buy it, actually. They had a choice between Fayette, Fayette State Park, which is a ghost town, and Pequamie. And the price for Pequamie was too high, so they actually went to Fayette, as we know. Um, he purchased as a source of raw materials for Kingsford. He purchased it in 1921. He purchased it from the Hebberts. The Hebberts owned that way back in the 18-something. And um, there was Charles Hebert and Dan Hebert, uh, Charles Hebert Jr. and, and Mary Hebert, making Mary Hebert Morris of Morris School. They, they, they had mansions there, which I'll show you in a second where they were at. When Henry Ford bought it, his supervisor hated Daniel Hebert and took a bulldozer to the other two, except for Daniels. Henry Ford wanted Daniels, and the supervisor wanted to keep his job, so he didn't dare take a bulldozer to that one. But uh, that's the only reason Dan stayed. Uh, that's Dan Hebert's. Charles Sr., Charles Jr., and Mary's went to the bulldozer after Ford bought it. Um, he spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on the school system alone. Um, 
And he purchased it kind of as something to tinker with. He wanted something to, something more to tinker with, um, not just for the wood. Um, he paid a million dollars for it. Uh, that's what he bought that town for in 1921. Uh, it had a sawmill, maintenance building, powerhouse docks, barges, 85 dwellings, three churches, a town hall, a hotel for single workers, plus uh, 40,000 acres of timber line. And it was the ideal town in Henry Ford's mind because he could take and do what he wanted with it all within his power. He owned lock, stock, and barrel, everything. Uh, the sawmill had a capacity of 60,000 board feet for eight hour shift. Uh, the lumber was not air dried in this case because there were no, it was air dried because there's no uh, kilns in that case. In uh, 1930, some of the best lumber from this mill went to the Here Mountain Club for his cabin, as they call him up there, his cabin for construction of the Her uh, Herring Ford Lodge. Uh, he did make some quick changes when he bought Pequamming. Uh, he said that, uh, first of all, he wanted the mill different. He built a new mill. This is Church Row. I'm going to jump kind of Church Row. Church Row uh, is this area right here. And Church Row, if this church looks familiar, this is the Methodist Church at the top of the hill. This is the Methodist Church. This was this was Hebert's Church. The window in the back, that big same window in the back of that church is from Charles Hebert's son drowning in the back of that church. And his son drowned and he donated that church. And uh, he, he was well, church row, but he had a stained glass window specially made for his son drowned for that occasion. And that church was moved to Longs, and that's at the top of the hill. This is a Catholic church hill, a Catholic church. This is Holy Name. When you drove down, you drive down the road, this is the Catholic church, the Holy, Holy Name of Sinons. That's that one. And this church right here, so down next is the Lutheran church. That is the annex to the Catholic church. If you look, there's a building off to the side of the Catholic church. And, and if you look off to the side, thank you. It's, if you look off to the side, that's the Catholic church off to the, uh, the Lutheran church off to the side of the Catholic church. Behind there, you can very barely see it, but that was the school. So we know this is prior to 1933, because this is the high school. That high school, the school building was a grade school, I'm sorry. And the grade school is located right in here. This is it says the cemetery is going to be over here. So the school, the churches are, I'm sorry, are right here. All the churches are right here. Okay, that's church row. And, and the, high, the grade school is located here, which of course was replaced. And you can kind of see the bluff where you're going across here. So that was um, that area there. That's another shot of that Methodist church. You look up and kind of see some similarities between. Of course, there's sandstone, wave-washed sandstone on that church now, but that was, the, that was the church. And this is the Catholic church now that was there. Of course, it was closed down, broken up. This is Oddfellas Hall. So when he built it, he established this is Oddfellas Hall. This is where the single lumberjacks could stay when they came in from Woods. This is a post office here, and you're looking down the road towards the general store. Um, he wanted this model town to be self-sufficient. So he raised, uh, he wanted everybody to be happy. He raised the wages on the 300 workers to, from 350 to $5 per day. But he demanded that they punch a clock, mow their lawns. Um, and he wanted a showcase of South Reliance and education. And under this concept, he built the modern schools and the modern schools were that you were going to teach um, two grades. I can tell you what it is. If you go to Kwame, you can teach two grades. The kindergarten was taught in the mansion. Kind of interesting. You're going to enjoy this concept of education. Quite amazing. Is that he based it on his education in the wilderness growing up. And he based it on the McGough Reader. The McGough Reader was what Henry Ford instituted into his system. Okay, he was very proud of the McGough Reader. Was a, his, uh, McGough was an educational expert, and he incorporated that in his schools. So the kindergarten were taught in the mansion, and he built a playground, and around the playground was to be four grade schools. 1933, 
this is where someone lost his job because he didn't follow through when Henry Ford says, I want this built. When Henry Ford wanted it built, he didn't want it built two years from now. He wanted it built yesterday. And you should have known that. If you didn't know that, you were in trouble. But he wanted it built, so he's 1933, he wants to build it. Doesn't get built actually the grade schools until about 35 or 36 when you finish them. And the high school, of course, is 37. So he builds that school, he builds them, and two grades are in each school. Okay, and each, uh, then they go to the high school. Okay, um, and what do you do with those schools? Is well, let's go on here. We'll cover this a little bit more here. This mill, not my back. Um, this is, I want to show you what the mill looked like before. This is 1921, and this is 1928 actually. This mill was built in 1924. This mill, so you can see quite a difference. You can see um, fiber system. Henry Ford, one of those fiber system. You can remember these buildings are still here, okay? And kind of interesting about another thing about Henry Ford is that if you look at all the windows in here, why all the windows? Why all the windows? Henry Ford loved steam. And he wanted the people to see how the steam engines operated. So if you go to any of the mills, you go to Kingsford, you go to the mills in River Rouge and that to this day, you'll see all the powerhouses are all windows. Actually, if you go to Munising and you go by Munising, the, and you look where the high school is at in Munising, just before you get to Munising High School, look off to your left if you're coming from Marquette, and you're going to see a fenced area. And around that fence is the structure for his powerhouse that never got built. He didn't have time to build it before he died. But that was the structure was gonna be just like this. Just like that. And it's, the foundation is still there. The abutments for the structures are still there. But that's the way it was going to look. So he loved steam. Uh, every, um, every one of his mills um, that he had control of had that type of powerhouse because that's the way that he wanted it. Um, when he bought it, of course, lumber was very important, so he had, he bought, uh, he bought uh, vessels from World War I, uh, the barges and the tugs. He had the Bartlow, which he made into the luxurious tug for his wife and him. They had the Buttercup, he had the Bartlow, the Barton, um, and then he had some of the ships that were, that were ships in World War I were broken down and made into barges. So he had, those were barges. And they would go between Pukwami and, and uh, uh, River Rouge, and they'd also go to Lons. Uh, the, the, this was a J. Morris, I mentioned Mary Hebert Morris, and there's the Hebert, the Daniel Hebert. This is the Barlow. That's a luxurious tub, by the way, of Henry Ford. There's an interesting story how Henry Ford operated. Jo, this comes from Joe Anderson. Any Anderson relatives here, Anderson? Is that uh, Joe was a superintendent of, of Pukwami. Okay, in the 1930s, and whenever Ford came into any town, you took a walk. That was normal. Take a walk with the boss, and tell him what's going on in this town. Okay, he wants to know how is everything going. How are the people? How's the mail operating? How's and it could be a pleasant walk, or maybe a not pleasant walk. You hope it was a pleasant walk. If you went up to the mansion any other time, it was probably your walking papers. Okay. So he went up there, and the superintendent would go up there, and Joe tells me these stories, two of them quick, kind of interesting. He's on the tug, the bark boat, and they're going from Pequamie to Lance. No offense to any engineers from Michigan Tech or that, but there's an engineer, a young man from Michigan Tech, and he's on the tug, and he is telling Ford what to do. <laughs> Bad mistake. Wasn't educated too well, I guess, in that case, because he's pointing his finger. You never, never pointed your finger with Henry Ford. And he's telling Henry Ford that he's got to do this. Henry Ford leaves the pilot house, upper cabins. He goes down to Joe Anders. He says, Fire him. I want him fired. Now, fire him. Tug goes back into Tequani. Guys let off. Of course, the two hour rule. He's packed up. But Henry Ford now decides not to go to, on the Bartlow. He decides he's going to go by car. 
Unfortunately, you get around first sand beach and Henry Ford's one of his trucks. Where were the trucks? Broken down. Bad news. And Henry Ford turns, turns to Joe and says, I wanted him fired. I want him gone. And Joe said, he is gone. He is fired. He's out of town. He's leaving. I want him gone. Now, I don't want you to think he wants him hurt in any way, but his idea is he controlled everything. He wants him gone. And the guy's on the highway. Joe, or for Mr. Ford, the guy's gone. He's out of your town. He's on the public highway. He's broken down. And Joe said, I tried to explain that to Mr. Ford. He really didn't understand. The only good thing out of that, Mr. Whitman, is I got a whole new fleet of trucks the next day. <laughs> Another story about, and I think this is, shows uh, how Henry Ford's his personality of what he thought of Edison, Firestone, President Harding, is Joe went on the cable walk with Mr. Ford, and he's out on the cable walk. The cables are still there, by the way. The, the black and white that you see with the big cables that you see on a highway, that was the cable walk. That's what Ford had. Some of them were still there. And he said, I got back and we sat on the veranda in the mansion, and I asked Mr. Ford, how come he had such close friends? I mentioned this to Etzel, his great-grandson, when I gave the closing remarks at the convention. And I said, he, and Joe said, why do you have such close friends? And he turned to, uh, Ford turned to Joe and he says, you know, time does many things. It separates places, things, and events. But time never separates friends. And he said, I jumped up and he said, excuse myself, ran into the bungalow and rolled it down. And uh, he said that was a, think of that, how Henry Ford thought of, thought of his friends. But that's going, a couple stories on, on what was going on there. That's the Barclow. Um, and now this is a tramway. So if you take Pequamy here, and, and you look at this mill right here. Okay, here's the tramway. Here is the Roman at Bobby Hagen's house. This is where Fran Whitman lives right here. That tramway had the world's most amount of lumber in 1934. The world's most amount of lumber was on that tramway. And this is a shot of Fran Whitman's house. If you know where Fran Whitman lives, her house is right about here. This is would be Matt Leckel's house, where Maleka was at, and going towards uh, Fintown and Sweettown. So this is where they ran. These are the tramways that went out from that mill. That's how much wood was there, to give you an idea. Tremendous amount of wood. <laughs> These are the schoolhouses. I mentioned the schoolhouses. Uh, that's the high school, the grade schools, the kids around the grade school. The way the schoolhouses was, I mentioned, I started to tell you about this. The schoolhouses were built so that, and Barbara Antos has one, is that in the back there was a partition. The teacher lived alongside the schoolhouse. You had to be a single female teacher to be employed by Ford. He selected you. I got an interesting letter. I don't know what he did, the, the, the teacher did, but it didn't please Henry Ford. He sent a letter to President Tate. President Tate was the president of Northern Normal School, now known as Northern Michigan University. Okay? I don't have Henry Ford's letter, but I got the letter from Henry Ford to President Tate. Or from, I got the letter from President Tate back to Henry Ford. And President Tate tells Henry Ford this, we don't educate teachers the way that you want them educated. If you wanted it educated that way, educate him yourself. Now, if he was a Ford employee, you wouldn't have to worry what truck he was on. But uh, it's kind of interesting. Henry Ford wanted certain teachers a certain way, and there's a letter that's kind of rough. The agency tells Henry Ford that she doesn't look like a Jew. Her name is not Jewish, and she doesn't speak like a Jew. Kind of, you know, you, you think of not a sinner, not a saint, is that the agency is telling Henry that this is an individual woman who's applying for a job, educated, has a degree, but they're looking at how to hire the teachers. Uh, when you're looking at that school, you're going to see there's a partition in that school. There's a partition in the back room. Why? You had, the, you had the classroom here, and you had the teacher in the front, okay? And you had the door that come in here, and you have a vestibule. And there's our partition that goes across the back of that classroom. Why? 
Any ID? And your coats. It was a coat rack. Well, there was a coat rack there. Yeah, you could hang your coats there, but there was a vestibule you hung your coats and put your overshoes in that. So that wasn't for that purpose. That was not built for that purpose. The purpose it was built for is so that LL Close, Mr. Crepe Shoes as they called him, and Mr. Dow, Crepe Shoes as they called him, they put crepe on their shoes and walk in to listen to the teacher teach. And Henry Ford would do the same thing to make sure you were teaching the way that he wanted you to teach. So they had a, a partition there on these schools. There was a partition that went back across that and, uh, and for Mr. Crepe Shoes and all close and Mr. Dow would go um, and listen to the teacher teach. So. Uh, kindergarten was taught in his mansion, as I mentioned, so he'd come right out and listen to the teacher teach. So he did, he did monitor education very well. Uh, that's one of the stoves, the very interior stove that uh, was used in the classroom. What the schoolhouses looked at the end, um, the high school, okay, that's the maintenance garage where the fire truck is at. Um, Henry Ford wanted things done a certain way, as I said many times. He wanted, uh, the kids wanted the skating rink, okay? Um, and um, the big, little kids, if you mentioned, I mentioned to you, little kids in the Ford fire truck and taking them up to the mansion, they were the little kids. The big kids never got to Ford. Little kids asked for little things. Big kids asked for big things. Mm -hmm. Big things meant the superintendent had more work. The superintendent was normal human being. He didn't want more work. So the big kids were kept away from Ford by the security men. Some say the servicemen, service, uh, security men, boom squad. Unfortunately, that was the case with some of them. So the big kids never got to Henry Ford. Except sometimes they did. That was bad for the superintendent. So they had asked for a skating rink. And they asked and asked and never got it more work for the superintendent. And finally a big kid got to Henry Ford and asked for the skating rink. So this is, some of you will recognize some names here, Edward Cavanaugh, John Hurd, Doris Salo, Isabel Hakenen, right there. That's your mother. That's Isabel Hakenen. And uh, they're, on a, they're working on a loom from Greenfield Village. Um, and, so, and this is a spinning wheel. It's a loom of spinning wheels brought from Greenfield Village. Henry Ford brought instruments up from Greenfield Village for the Henry Ford schools in, in, in the Pequamie. That's either my mother or my Aunt Doris. There you go. Yeah. I mentioned gardens, okay. All the schools had gardens. This is a Pequamie school gardens. I mentioned to you, oh, it works me with Scott, but I've talked long enough, is these are the first prefab homes in the world. Those are by Sears and Roba. My Franny's home is right here. Maleko's home is there. Uh, my sister Franny's home is here. Maleko's home is here. Bobby Hagen's home is here. You can kind of put it in perspective with the Ford Tower. But this is a Pequamie Gardens. You have to grow gardens. Kids had to learn how to grow gardens. That's the way it was. Um, More photographs of the kids in the gardens. Yeah, Ray McDonald is, uh, is McDonald's here? His son? Oh, that's your dad. That is your dad. Your dad had straight A students. I've gone through all the school records and your dad had straight A students. Straight A's. Yeah, I put some dirt on people. Yeah, I don't doubt that. When you look at his report cards and you read the writing what the teacher said, I can see why. I didn't keep up with it. Uh, more pictures of the garden. Uh, Henry Ford in Pequamie, that is actually in Pequamie, at one of the fields there. Uh, you can see the kids sleigh riding, and I think they're projector jobs, so, but this is at the bungalow, and you notice Ford will not be in it, but the kids would sleigh ride, part of what they did. One in the kindergarten and at the bungalow, because that's where the kindergarten was held at. Uh, another at the bungalow is back here and performing classes. I mentioned that they would square dance. They had to dress up. It was mandatory to dress up. And this is during Halloween, I think. And yeah, Halloween party. They're at the bungalow. You can see it's the bungalow. Ford is up there for that because he was always at these parties. 
but the, uh, he would not be in the photographs. That was not, he did not want that to happen. Uh, this is a patriotic party, you can tell. This is uh, Oscar Olson and Mrs. Larson and Erling Olson. So that's the, the, the people in that photograph and all these kids. I know, who is this? This is Miriam Roa, or is that Miriam Timberline or Miriam? But that's, I know who that is, it's, Miriam, it's a roll-off. Um, the Ford fire truck, this arrived, uh, this was pinstriped by Arthur Napoleon Allert. Allert? Art Allert? That's his dad. He pinstriped, he was a painter. He pinstriped that for Henry Ford the day after it arrived in Pukwami. The same fire truck is sitting out there. That's what it looked like. It doesn't look like that now, but that's what it looked like. Part of the mansion. This is one of the class trips. This is called the bus. The students referred to it as the hearse. <laughs> they also referred to it as the Black Mariah. These were the buses. They were station wagons, big vehicles, not like the buses we have today, but these were big vehicles, and the students kindly referred to them as the hearse. But this is what transported the kids around from Pukwami to Alberta. Because Alberta students came to Pukwami for high school. They did not go to Longs. The bus went to Alberta and picked up the high school kids, brought them to, uh, to Pukwami. Now, kind of interesting with this, George. You know who George is? George Carrier. The petty bone carry lift. That's George Carrier. He built this. This is part of the classes in the heart and the uh, the shop where the you remember Henry Ford said you will learn and you will come to my mill. Part of learning was doing woodwork. This was called the chub. Thank God carrier built the carry lift better than built the chub because they put the chub in the hot pond and it sank. <laughs> Another photograph of the chub being built. They built toboggans, Ted Roloff, I'm sure all of you have heard of Ted Roloff, I think he just passed away unfortunately. Ted Roloff built the toboggan, he still has the toboggan, he showed it to me several years ago, but he has the toboggan that the kids built in that uh, workshop. Basketball team, they won seven consecutive teams the first year that they were a high school, they won this, in those days we did not have a state championship, we had the Lower Peninsula State Championship and the Upper Peninsula State Championship. This school won the first Class D state championship the first year they were open, and they didn't have a gym. They went to Lons to practice. This is, a, this is um, Paul Van Abel, this is Jack Doyle, this is Leo Milo, I'm trying to think who that is. I don't have it. I know the face, but this is Paul Van Abel, and that's Jack Doyle. Interesting enough with him. Interesting enough with him. He was a number one player. Not that it, things are old or new. He was a number one player. The following year, this is the year they won the state championship. The following year, father got transferred. Guess where? Dearborn. <laughs> this is your dad. Ray McDonald, and this is Jack Doyle. Kids like to play pranks. This is called the pranksters. If you notice, they've got whiskey bottles, they've got cigarettes, of course, those two things were forbidden in Pukwami, and it's certainly forbidden for young people, but it's called the pranksters. It's taken outside one of the, uh, the houses, the boarding houses, and uh, Ford would not have appreciated that. Uh, once again, the school's playing. The high school. Yeah, that's looking at the bungalow from the water side. There was a walkway. Remember, I mentioned the cable walk. The cable walk went out through the fence and went out towards the point. That was the cable walk. You never, you always wanted to take one cable walk, not two. Once again, you can see the gate going out through the fence and in the bungalow. Henry, uh, Clara Ford loved peonies. On top of this was a time, was a time, the you know, time being they call it. Sundial. Sundial. I'm sorry. Sundial. Sundial. And what did it say on top of that? Time is valuable. In every Ford plant, on all their clocks, he had one saying, time is valuable. Time never separates friends, 
Time is valuable. That was on that weather dial. Someone stole that, unfortunately. But this whole garden was peony. Clara Ford loved peony. Therefore, every garden will be peony. In fact, I mentioned the powerhouse. All the windows. Let's turn to Big Bay quickly. And we'll be... This is Big Bay. He was seen out 43. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Uh, he was. Uh, he suffered the stroke at 43. He got better in 44. He came back up. Uh, he was kind of docile. Went to the Huron Mountain Club, but he needed something to tinker with. Um, at the Huron Mountain Club, there are no phones in those days. I don't know if you're aware of that. There were no phones allowed. So if you wanted to make a phone call, you went to Baycliffe Health Camp. And Baycliffe Health Camp was where Ford would go. There was an agreement between Albemora and him that his police, the servicemen, goes with, would be kept outside the gate. And she would protect him and Clara while they were inside the gate of the of the Bay Cliff House camp, and that's what they did. So they would be in there, the police would be kept outside. Um, Henry would always turn to Clara and say, go find, uh, Henry would turn and say, go find Clara, send the kids to find Clara. Clara would say, go find them, the, uh, go find Henry. If the best blessing in the world, you'll find, was to be a sick kid in the UP, be at the UP health camp, and have Henry Ford bless you. Why? You wouldn't know why. Why? You're sick, your father may have a job, but not a lot of money to get the best treatment in the world, hey? Henry Ford, Albemore would pick out one kid a year, and Henry Ford would come to the club many times, but at one time when he'd come, at time during the year, Alba would present the child. The father was given a job at River Rouge, was given a house that he could keep, was given a car they could keep, and the child was put at Henry Ford Hospital, which was that time the best hospital in the world, until he was cured. That's what Henry Ford did. Right in front of Henry Ford's view of looking at his mill. Bad move, bad move. So he offered to pay to move the railroad station, and they refused. Well, there's always a solution. There's a solution to everything. So, instead of moving the railroad station, he bought the railroad and then moved the station. <laughs> that was the solution to this problem. Um, when, he, when he was sick, he, 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 I mentioned he's sick, is that he's failing. He wants to build, and if you look at the river that goes from Lake Independence into Lake Superior, he started to build the hydro plant there. Um, he passed away before the hydro plant could be built. He also wanted to build a hydro plant at, uh, at the Heron Mountain Club, and they wouldn't let him. He wanted to build at Mountain Falls. They wouldn't let him. And years later, when they were paying buku bucks for uh, operating an oil power plant, they regretted it. But he wanted to build a hydro plant within the Heron Mountain Club. They wouldn't let him. And uh, that was to their chagrin. <laughs> this is the Heron Mountain Club, the Ives Mountain Range, the Heron Mountain Range, the Mummy Mountain Range. I took my wife up there at 6 o'clock one morning and we came out to rain store at 9 o'clock and she said, I can't understand why I married you. <laughs> but uh, this is Ice uh, Mountain Lake here, okay? Um, this is Henry Ford's lodge. This is his actual lodge, what was his lodge there. You can see the size of those timbers, how huge they were. Of course, that came from Pukwami. Uh, that timber came from Pukwami. These are some of the cabins at the Huron Mountain Club. <coughs> They're called cabins, as you can tell, they're little small cabins. cabins. Um, every cabin of one of the 50 members has got to be on the water, by the way. It cannot be any place else. Henry Ford at the Heron Mountain Club. Actually, that bridge still exists. He built it. I can understand why it still exists. It's still there to this day. This is the Mountain Stream, and this is Mountain Falls. Have you ever seen Mountain Falls before? Now you have. That's Mountain Falls. Um, they put a printed that in the Detroit Free Press about 40 years ago and they denied it was. They said, who could have taken that photograph because they take the cameras from here when you enter the gate. So that hopefully gives you an idea of what Henry Ford was to us, to your grandparents, you, your grandparents.